Let's prepare our hearts for God's word with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, you promise that we will go out, but we move into a place where you already are and you welcome us. And even as we've come into this house, you welcomed us here as well. So remind us that you are with us in all that we do. Open our hearts to your word and our spirits to your grace. For you are with us always, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we'll be reading the first chapter of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is one of the earliest documents we have of the church. And so it's an interesting study in how Paul was related to those early Christian communities. So listen to God's word as we hear 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 1 to 10. And the letter comes from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. It's addressed to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Paul writes, We always give thanks to God for all of you, and we mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that God has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And then you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. Your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for God's Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is to come. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the years, I've officiated at a lot of weddings and at a lot of funerals. And I recently realized that by and large, the funerals are more memorable. And that seems odd. Funerals are by definition somber affairs, while weddings are festive. Gowns and tuxedos, flowers and fanfares. But the difference is that you don't have testimonials in a wedding service. People don't tell stories about a wedding couple until usually later, maybe as they're gathered together with champagne toasts at a reception hall. But people often tell stories at a funeral. It may be a formal eulogy, or it may simply be a friend of the deceased who asks to share a few words. Now, funeral speeches are usually not the most polished, but because they are from the heart, they are often memorable, and they stick with us. And in that way, they are a gift, and in subtle ways, they change us forever. The author Kathleen Norris tells of a small Presbyterian church in North Dakota that would pause after the sermon for a time of announcements, or what they called sharing of joys and concerns. Now that was the time when you would learn that a young mother in the congregation was worried about her brother who was sick, or an 80-year-old widower was overjoyed that he'd become a great-grandfather for the first time. And Norris noted that all of this activity infinitely pleased the town gossips. And the phones would ring off the hook on Sunday afternoons with all the news gathered on Sunday morning. But actually, it was a good kind of gossip. It was that type that widened the prayer circle 
and reconnected the community to one another. Now this small church had a new pastor, and after the pastor had opened up the time of joys and concerns, someone from the back mentioned that a man named Bill O'Rourke had died, a man known as Wild Bill from his earlier drinking days. The pastor didn't know him, but then after that was announced, someone from the back said, you know, Wild Bill gave me the first 50 cents I ever earned. And after a pause, someone else said, yeah, and I bet you still have the same 50 cents. And folks laughed. But then they began sharing stories about Wild Bill. Uh, He used to break horses for the U.S. Cavalry during World War II, and because of that, he was permanently bow-legged. How he could always be found in the corner booth in the Main Street Cafe. How he collected old Ford pickup trucks, but he polished them and kept them running beautifully. And the stories kept coming since everyone had known Wild Bill, and those memories became a gift in the midst of joys and concerns. And finally, the minister said, let us pray. But the congregation had been praying all along. Last Sunday, we remembered a church member, Sue Bailey. We had a short service in the chapel after worship. Honestly, I thought only a few people would be there. So after worship, I had grabbed my book of common worship And I imagine reading a few scriptures, saying then the official words of committal and closing with a prayer. But actually quite a few people gathered in that space, including some people who had known Sue Bailey for years, back to her time in school. And so I opened it up for people to share stories, and they did so. They talked about Sue's artistic side, her creative spirit, her commitment to peace her love and advocacy for children. And before very long, that service changed. It went from a somber ritual of funeral language to a joyful celebration of a woman's life. And not only did the service change, we changed too. Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica is one of the very first letters we have from the entire Christian experience. See, Jesus died and was resurrected somewhere between 30 and 33 AD. And then Paul writes this letter to one of the young churches around 50 AD. So it's only been about 17 to 20 years after the death of Christ. We can assume that there are still lots of people around who had seen Jesus, maybe heard him preach or seen a miracle. And we know that those disciples closest to Jesus had begun to share the good news of his resurrection within Jewish Palestine. And then other apostles like Paul had taken that message around the coast of the Mediterranean into what is now Turkey and Greece. With this letter, And with this opening chapter, what we see is how the seeds of faith were taking root. And so the question is, what does this early glimpse at the Christian church actually tell us? Well, a lot of times when we think about the Apostle Paul, we think of him as a loner, as a wandering street evangelist, like the gentleman who stands on the corner of Penn and Highland with a microphone and preaches regularly to the passing pedestrians and anyone who's waiting to catch a bus. But this letter opens with naming a team, Paul, Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy. So there's a group here with different gifts, but all committed to sharing the gospel. It's like if a letter came from ELPC, it might begin Randy, Heather, Patrice, and BJ. We don't know exactly how Paul shared the gospel message in Thessalonica. There's a description of his time there found in Acts chapter 17. We know that he did preach in the synagogues, but we also know he was a leather worker, a maker of tents. And so perhaps Paul struck up conversations with people as they came to him for work. 
Maybe the gospel was proclaimed not by sermons, but by telling stories, by conversation shared over a workbench or around a dinner table. Like that small North Dakota church, maybe the sharing of the gospel came organically from sharing joys and concerns, less to do with anything formal and more to do with what we remember and tell one another, those glimpses of where God's love and grace and peace have touched our own lives. Now, the bulk of this first chapter to the Thessalonians is basically an expression of thanksgiving, Paul giving thanks to God for the working of the young church. Paul uses language that is very honest and very sincere because he knew their acceptance of the gospel had opened them up to affliction and persecution from the dominant secular pagan culture. But Paul had also seen the Holy Spirit taking root in their lives, and he had seen how they had been changed. And more importantly, Paul too had been changed. In verse 5, Paul said, You know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. Something in that interaction between Paul and Silas and Timothy and these people in Thessalonica changed them both. They both were enlivened and enlarged by this gospel. They both became not just listeners, but evangelists. And Paul goes on to say that they actually became imitators of one another. And their common witness became known throughout the entire region. And all of this, all of this is described as being an expression of joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. So Heather and the young people are right in that joy is not the same thing as happiness. Joy is not just the smile that comes to our face when we buy something special. It's not simply that feeling when we put our feet up at the end of the day or are contented after a, a big meal. But I would add to the definition that joy is something in motion. Joy is something inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's active. It's not passive. It's breathed into us and out from us in a way that's communal, in a way that's vulnerable. It's something that changes us for the good. Now, that may be felt in a small church as stories are shared about someone named Wild Bill. It may be felt in a chapel when stories and remembrances are given of a friend that literally transforms that time and space into a celebration of life. It may be that ability to joyfully say, like Paul did, you know what kind of person we became when we were together. And then holding on to that memory, working to be the best person possible through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. To do that means we become a recipient of the gift of joy, a gift given by an active Holy Spirit. Long ago, there was a man named Marcus Tullius Cicero. He lived about 100 years before Jesus. He was a Roman orator and statesman and philosopher. Now, in one of Cicero's writings, he actually quotes another Roman poet who wrote these words. Those who graciously show the way to someone who is lost kindles, so to speak, a light from their own light, and their own shines nonetheless because they have lit another's. Showing the way to someone who is lost is like lighting someone's torch from your own torch. And the act causes no diminishment to what you have, but through that act, both parties are blessed. The ones who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On Christmas Eve, we 
light candles from each other's candles, and no one's flame is diminished or weakened by the act, but instead through it all are illuminated. All can now see. All together can sing joy to the world. And that is the theme for this Sunday in Advent, joy. Paul to the Thessalonians spoke about this active joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. It moves and comes to be by God's grace in us. Paul's words made me think about the sharing of joys and concerns in church. It made me think of Sue Bailey and becoming a different person through remembering her life. It reminded me of Cicero and Advent candles and flames that are shared without being diminished. It's a gift. It's a gift in every way. And in some way, that is exactly what Paul was experiencing so long ago as he shared that gospel, as he remembered that church with gratitude and with joy, as he remembered what kind of person he became and how they even chose to imitate him and Christ, as he imitated them. And he knew that all that was needed was for them to keep walking forward with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so as the Apostle Paul said long ago, we say again to you, grace and peace and joy to you in the name of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.